As our sluggishness must be corrected by various afflictions, and as we must be awakened to seek a remedy for our distress, so the Lord does not intend that our minds shall be cast down, but rather that we shall fight keenly, which is impossible if we are not certain of success. For if we must fight while we are uncertain as to the result, all our zeal will quickly vanish. When, therefore, Christ calls us to the contest, he arms us with assured confidence of victory, though still we must toil hard. The great Reformed theologian John Calvin penned those words 500 years ago, but they still ring true. This world is full of chaos and confusion, trial and tribulation, much of it resulting from the greater battle that's waging in the spiritual realm between good and evil. What are we to do? It can feel overwhelming and we can be tempted to run and hide in fear or perhaps ignore it in apathy and complacency. Neither of these responses are helpful in the present nor hopeful for the future. There is a better way forward, one of faith and of courage. This week in our final message in our Thrive series, we'll study a text from John's gospel where Jesus challenges his disciples with this very concept. He will provide them with help and hope, assuring them that in him they can take heart and find peace because he, Jesus Christ, has overcome the world. This is our last week in a series we call Thrive. Not if, but when. Looking at spiritual practices and disciplines that Jesus taught. We're studying the things Jesus assumed we'd do or the things Jesus assumed would happen, which we're kind of talking about today. And John 16, if you're unaware of how to look something up in the Bible, you can just look at the table of contents in the front, find John, and then you can get there and look to chapter 16, the big numbers, all right, in the chapters. John 16 is where we're at today, and we're going to be looking at a when, not if, but when Jesus says, when you will be scattered. And he's speaking to the disciples. There's this time in the disciples' journey with Jesus where Jesus is continuing to reveal himself as the Messiah and he's starting to give them bad news. He's starting to let them know that, you know, eventually he'll be arrested. He'll be taken from them. And as we know, being on this side of history, they'll take him to the cross and he'll make the payment, face the punishment for the sin of humanity. Now, thankfully, he will rise on the third day, conquer sin and death, and ascend to heaven to prepare a place for those who will believe in him and trust in him. But in this moment, at this place in the gospel where Jesus is teaching the disciples, uh, there's something bigger that he's going to reveal, and, and he's going to kind of make an assumption and maybe even a prediction of what uh, is to come. Okay, so if you're at John 16, we want to look at verse 31. John 16, verse 31. Let's get started. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered. Not if, but when. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Okay, verse 31 is key. He, he says, J Jesus, it says Jesus answers them, do you now believe? And Jesus has been teaching them and they have been on a wild ride. Let's face it. They've been with him through miracles and feeding thousands of people and rebuking religious leaders. And, and it, it, he's an amazing teacher. And they followed him. They've given their lives to him. And they, they do believe that he's the son of God. But Jesus is kind of giving them a warning. He's kind of giving them bad news. Uh, he's saying, you know, don't be so sure of yourself. You, you believe now, but there's going to come a time where you're going to scatter. And, and so the assumption, when we start with Jesus' assumption here, is that they, the disciples, will scatter and they will leave Jesus all alone. That's what's going to happen. 
And maybe assumptions, like I said before, not a good description for today's Thrive message for this last one. Maybe prediction is better. Maybe this is a prophetic piece that Jesus is doing, but considering Jesus is God, he's been there at the beginning during this time. He, he, he still is, he always was. And so there's this pointer backwards, this word in particular, scatter. But Jesus is actually pointing to prophecy the prophecy of Zechariah. So if you kind of pause, put a bookmark in John, and we're going to jump all the way back to the Old Testament, to Zechariah. And Zechariah 13, Zechariah 13. And in Zechariah 13, verse 7, uh, there is a prophecy that points to the shepherd's sheep scattering, that the shepherd, it's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, and the one to come, uh, that would be Jesus, son of God, the savior of the world, but that the people that follow him, his sheep will, uh, will scatter. Now, Jesus knows this. Jesus is referring to this. Some of the other gospel accounts point to it uh, more directly, like in Mark's gospel. Uh, but the uh, if you have a study Bible in that John passage, you can actually see there's a footnote placed in there that this is a pointer. Jesus is speaking about this prophecy. So let's read it here. Uh, Zechariah 13, verse 7. Uh, it reads, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So these disciples, they love Jesus. They're devoted to him. I, I don't think there's a doubt at this point. If you read through John's gospel at this point, they've given everything to follow him. But again, he, he still, Jesus is still fairly popular. The, the people have not yet turned. The fulfillment of the schemes of religious and political leaders haven't yet met their fulfillment at this point. And Jesus is saying, look, even though you love me, even though you're devoted to me, unfortunately, there's going to come a time where you're going to leave me. You're going to run in fear, scatter to your homes and hide. Peter, uh, one of the more well-known disciples, he actually, we find out he'll actually deny Jesus three times. Quite a sad situation. The theologian Frederick F. Bruce puts it this way. Jesus read their hearts better than they knew. Not only could he answer their unspoken questions, but he could assess the strength of their belief in him. It was sincere and genuine, bound up with their love for him, but it was about to be exposed to a test such as they had not imagined. For all their faith and love, they would abandon him in the hour of his greatest need. When I think about this and I reflect on myself, I, I have to ask, you know, I wonder, would I be any different in this situation? Would I stick by Jesus or would I scatter as well? If I were one of these disciples, would Jesus say to me, Jeremy, you'll, you'll scatter and you'll run to your home. And, and maybe for you, you need to reflect on that too. What would you do? What would we all do? I, I have a feeling that we would all be the same. These disciples are just, you know, average people just like you and I. And I think when it came down to it for us as well, we'd probably run and scatter. When Jesus loses his fame and popularity and they want to kill him and they arrest him and I think we'd run. But here's the good news. Jesus offers now the instruction, the assumption or really the prediction that he's already given. Uh, but then he, he moves into this and, and this is hopeful so again, he, he says, you know, they're going to they're gonna scatter each one of them to their homes and, you know, they're going to run and hide. Uh, but then he says this, yet, yet, that's important, that word, yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. See, the instruction here is, is that Jesus is not and has never been alone. This is an important passage because this is another one of those pointers that we have in Jesus' teaching to 
Uh, first, his deity, that he is God and that there's a, a godly uh, connection between God the Father and Jesus. But then also this is a pointer to Trinity, right? Trinity is three persons eternally existing as one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here we have Jesus talking about part of the Trinity of Father and Son. So this is an important piece of scripture. And, and that Jesus is saying here, look, even when I'm all alone, I'm never alone because the Father and Jesus are intimately and eternally connected. Intimately and eternally connected. So where, why is this important? Why is it important for the disciples that Jesus has this constant connection with God, this communion with God? Why is it important? that the son and the father are united, even when Jesus is all alone. Well, Jesus says, he, he says these things, he has told them these things so that in him, in Jesus, they may have peace. Even though they'll be scared, even though they'll be fearful and they're running and hiding, that they will be able to find peace not just in the words Jesus saying, but specifically that, that what the words reflect are in him. In Jesus, we find peace because Jesus is connected always eternally, intimately with the father. God, the father, overseer, protector, provider, that Jesus, the son who is our redeemer, that he's connected to God and that the peace that, that they can experience and that we too can experience comes from knowing that Jesus is a son of God, that, that they are connected. All right. This is, this is why the apostle Paul, he, when he writes to uh, Philippians in the new Testament, uh, the church in Philippians, the Christians that were in the city of Philippi, you know, he writes them and he says, and the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Okay, that peace that even in chaos and confusion and trial and tribulation, in that moment, people that can find peace, it, 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 it's, it's beyond comprehension. It doesn't make sense. There's no way in that kind of chaos that you should find peace, but you can. That's the peace of God. And, and it, it guards our hearts and minds, right? How? In Christ Jesus. See, same thing. You know, Jesus says here, I have said these things so that in me, right, in Jesus, you will have peace. And, and then Paul repeats this later saying that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart, will guard your mind, okay? That'll give you that peace. And where does it come from? Where does it stem from? It's in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the peace that humanity craves. And we, we have to lean into Jesus if we want peace. When our world is chaotic, when we're confused, when we're anxious, when we're scared, the worst thing we can do is to lean away from Jesus because he is the source of peace. And the closer a person gets to Jesus Christ, the more they devote their life to Jesus Christ, because he is the son of God, he's the savior, he's the authority, the king of that, that God has bestowed, God the father bestowed on him and through him, that's where the peace comes from. And so for me, maybe, maybe for you, maybe you are scared in this moment, maybe you're terrified, maybe you're struggling, but in Jesus, lean into Jesus. But now there's a big why there, right? Uh, for you, maybe for the disciples, they're like, well, that's all fine and good, but how does this work? This is where we get to the application. In verse 33, Jesus says right after this uh, part where they can find peace in him, right? He is the source of peace. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation, okay? Tribulation is kind of a biblical word for struggle, trial, destruction, disorder, chaos, confusion. This word tribulation wraps up all that. And maybe right now you're looking at the world and you're like, wow, I feel like our world is full of tribulation. And I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of areas of the world that are just in chaos. And, and, I, and if I look at the news, if I look at social media, I'm like, man, it's confusion. It's chaotic out there. It's, it's 
tribulation, it feels like, or at least tribulation is on the way, it feels like. Um, it's hard to know who's right, who's wrong, when everyone's arguing and fighting and there's rage and anger. And maybe you feel like that too. And, and Jesus says, in this world, this world is chaotic. In the world, you will have tribulation. And he says, but take heart. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. There will be tribulation. He's, he's not promising it all go away. He's saying it's going to be hard, but take heart because he has overcome the world. Now, this word take heart in our culture, you know, if someone were to say take heart, you know, it's kind of encouraging, you know, it's kind of a, you know, bit of a good job. Like it, it, it doesn't have the weight that it would have carried in the first century in the ancient world. And, and a, a better translation, if you look at, if you study this text and these words take heart, it's almost like Jesus is saying uh, in this take heart, be courageous or be brave or uh, have faith like that. This take heart. If we could wrap up, you know, be brave, be courageous, have faith, take heart. If we could wrap that up into maybe an English word and, and give that, that's what we're, that's what he's talking about here. And the disciples will, they are going to, we know being on this side of history and, and, and reading through the rest of the New Testament and reading the history books on what happened to the disciples they faced difficulties and trials that most of us can't even understand. There are many Christians in the developing world and in certain areas of the world that are facing some of the trials and tribulations that, that the first disciples felt. I, I have to be honest, I, I don't feel those. And, and maybe, you know, if you're in Western culture, we don't, we don't feel it too heavy. You know, maybe our day will come, I don't know, but... The disciples and us live in this dual existence. On one level, those of us who have given our life to Jesus Christ, we've put our trust in him. And I would hope if, you, if you're searching right now that you would do that. Uh, for those that, that have done that, we are in Jesus Christ. We are in through him, by him. Like we become a part. Uh, he, he talks about a vine and that we're kind of grafted in. We're, we're a part. He's the vine and, and, and we connect to him through our uh, devotion, commitment, our, our trust in Jesus. And, and we have that reconnection to God through Jesus. And so we're a part of him and we're in Jesus and Jesus is in us. And yet this dual existence right now, we're also in the world. We exist in this fallen, broken, chaotic world. And even if, if we're being honest about ourselves, like sometimes I, you know, I live in the spirit that, that the Holy Spirit convicts me and I follow it. And, and I'm, and, and I hear Jesus calling me to uh, something better, something more beneficial, something meaningful and greater. And I follow that and I'm, I'm living in the spirit. And then there's other times where I make poor choices and either my, my anger, my frustration, my anxiety, my fears, whatever it may be, it, it pulls me to live in what's referred to in the Bible as the flesh. And, and, and I follow the world's way. And, I, and, and there's this battle that's going on that's talked about in the New Testament between spirit and flesh, even inside of us. And, and so we, we who trust in Jesus, we live in this dual existence where we're in Jesus. We live in Jesus spiritually, but we're physically in this world. And so the disciples are going to be faced with this reality as well, where they're living in Jesus. You know, eventually uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit will come, which you read about in Acts, but they'll still be under the persecution and the tribulation of the world that they're living in. And it's going to be hard. But Jesus says, continue to cling to him because he has overcome the world. You see, the world's just this physical place here, but there's a spiritual realm. And Jesus will take final authority in the end that, that when the day comes, when Jesus returns and in his second advent, his appearance, when he comes uh, like a warrior, uh, you know, on a cloud and, 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 and comes with trumpet call and, and comes to war on evil and sin and darkness and the enemy, Satan, and, and to defeat him, that when that comes, you know, Jesus is calling out to a time um, that is so important for us who, who trust in Jesus. 
But in the meantime, he has also overcome our sin. He's overcome that part of the world. He paid for our sin on the cross. And, and our trust in him and our belief in that and that he paid for it, but then defeated sin and death in the resurrection. And so we have that. He has overcome. We place our trust in him. We can be courageous. We can have faith. We can be brave. We can take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. There's a commentary, a modern commentary called Opening Up John's Gospel by Andrew Patterson. It's a great book. I would encourage you to have a look at it. He unpacks John's Gospel and adds some great thoughts, and, and it's a really easy read. And I want to read something from there related to this passage. Patterson writes, John also intends us to see that for all those who love the Savior and keep their eyes fixed on him, whatever situations or circumstances they may be experiencing, great joy is derived from trusting him. We know he is at work. We know he has his sure and certain purposes. The trials, pains, and difficulties of living in this sin-sick world will be forgotten in the light of his presence. Now, I think when we look at this world, we all agree that in our lives we're going to have trouble of some sort. There are difficult things that we all face. Uh, even outside of the global stuff we're seeing in pandemic and COVID, all these different restrictions and all the stuff we're hearing in the news, even just in our lives as human beings, there's tough stuff. You're going through tough stuff. You know, I'm going to go through tough stuff. So what do we do with that? Well, I, I think when trial and tribulation or chaos and confusion, when tough times come, there's always a temptation to scatter. I want to say that again. When trial and tribulation come, there's always a temptation to scatter. And maybe you're scattering right now. Now scattering looks different maybe in 2021. You know, maybe, uh, you know, it's not like just running to your home and just hunkering down or digging yourself into a bunker, or maybe it is. I don't know. I, I don't know where you're at. But maybe you are really fearful. Maybe you're terrified. You are so full of anxiety and stress and you just want to hide away. You just want to stay in your bed. You don't even want to get up. Um, but maybe for you, scattering is a little different. It's like, you know, a way of scattering that we have the benefit of doing in modern Western society, safe, fairly peaceful society, and it's complacency and apathy, where maybe for you, you just look at it all and you've just stopped caring. It's still scattering. It's still leaning away from Jesus. It's still leaning away from the conviction and, and the passion and the devotion that brings a fuller life, a more meaningful, eternal life, a legacy life. But it might not be fear and anxiety. I got it. But maybe for you, it is. You just stopped caring. And you're just apathetic, complacent. And maybe you don't even know how to get out of that. I think if we look at this text and if we're to place ourselves in it and if, if Jesus were speaking to us or, or if he could be here and encourage us, I, I think these words still ring true a bit. That when tribulation comes, when tough times come, don't scatter. Don't scatter either fearfully, anxiety-filled. Don't scatter complacent or apathetic. Don't scatter. Take heart. In him, we find peace. In him, we gain courage and, and bravery and because he's overcome the world. That whatever anxiety or stress that you are dealing with, whatever complacency or apathy that you've chosen to walk down, it's not the best version of who you are. And, and it's not living a life of freedom and peace that the gospel of Jesus Christ offers. Again, I'm not saying that stuff won't be difficult. Life might be hard right now for you. But if you want to overcome it, you won't do it on your own strength. 
If you want to find peace in it, you won't do it in your own strength. It only comes through Jesus Christ. So turn from the fear and anxiety and lean in to Jesus to find his peace. It takes courage, it takes heart and bravery and faith, but you can do it. And, and turn from that complacency and apathy and lean in to Jesus. It, it takes work, it takes discipline, it takes choice. You have to actually make up your mind. You can't just sit around and wait till you feel like leaning into Jesus. He's calling. What are you going to do? Scatter or find the courage and lean into him to find that peace that I think we're all yearning for. Today, as we close, I want to give us an opportunity to just, maybe for some of us, it's, it's to repent. To repent of the fear and anxiety, repent of the apathy and complacency repent of the scattering and to just tell Jesus we're sorry and, and we want to come back home and, and it's a choice to lean in. Um, maybe for you, like you, <laughs> you just landed on this video and you, you've never even heard any of this stuff before. Maybe you've tried a lot of stuff and a lot of self-help stuff, a lot of religious stuff, <laughs> maybe a lot of other stuff substance, poor relationships, and, and it's all, you're floundering. You're, you're just as scattered. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ, God gave him for this. God gave him the authority, the kingship over our lives, over the spiritual realm, and he can and has overcome. And he wants a relationship with you. God loved you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for the sin in your life, my life, so that our sin and our wrong and shame and anxiety, that it won't be a barrier between us and God, that we will have the freedom to go to God and have union with him. And our trust in Jesus Christ, that he not only died on the cross, but that he rose again. And at that resurrection, he defeated sin and death and has ascended to heaven to prepare a place for those who, who believe in him, that we also get the gift and the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives inside you. And that, that spirit, flesh struggle that I'm talking about, think about it. If you don't have the spirit, all you have is the flesh. If you're not in Jesus, you're only in the world. It's a life that can only lead to chaos. The peace, the courage, the faith, the overcoming, the ability to not scatter only comes through Jesus. And so let's pray. And if you would like to give your life to Jesus today, you can do that. And, and we're gonna pray for you and uh, you can pray with us. And you can give your life to Jesus today. You can lean into him to find peace and to overcome. Stop scattering today. Let's do it. Dear Father, I thank you for this passage in John. Oh, the disciples, they loved Jesus as much, maybe more than, than, than we do. And yet, when tough times came, Jesus knew they were going to run. But we thank you that you sent him to overcome the world. We thank you that you sent him to defeat sin and death. We thank you that you sent him to be be the atonement for our sin, to make a way that we could be uh, restored and redeemed. Father, we are sinful and fallen, and we ask for your forgiveness. We, we repent, and we believe that your son Jesus took that sin on the cross and paid for it and appeased your wrath. Father, we believe that on the third day he rose and defeated death and defeated sin, and we place our trust in him. And we believe he is ascended, preparing a place for us. Today, we choose to follow you and we ask that you give us the peace of Jesus Christ that surpasses all understanding, the peace of God that's found in Jesus, that guards our hearts and minds. <laughs> give us a way to not scatter. Give us a way to get rid of the confusion. 
give us a way out of the rage and anger we see on the news cycles and social media feeds. Help us be a voice of peace through Jesus. Please, Father. We thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to move to communion. If you don't have any uh, elements with you now, just pause the video and get some bread or crackers and uh, some juice or wine. And uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, looking at the communion account in Matthew 26. So you can go ahead and get there. And uh, the, the communion account, the Last Supper, Jesus is... Uh, right there. He is about to face arrest and betrayal and um, beatings, whippings, eventually the cross. But he takes this moment uh, called Passover, a, a long-standing um, Jewish remembrance, an important one that we that's from the Old Testament, going all the way back to the days of Moses when God saved the people of Israel from slavery. And Jesus is going to change it from an old covenant, an old commitment thing to a new covenant thing, a new commitment. That Jesus is going to be the new sacrifice and that the bread and cracker, it's going to represent his body and the, the wine, the juice is going to represent his blood. And they maybe didn't fully understand it at the time, but after his death and resurrection, they definitely did. And for us that live on this side of eternity, we, but on this side of history, uh, I should say, we understand what it means and, and we have the scripture and the teaching of it. And, and so I'm going to pray first for the bread and then I will read the passage related to the bread and then we'll take it together and then I'll pray for the cup and then I'll read the passage related to the cup, and then we'll take together. Okay, so let's just uh, take a moment to pray for the bread. Dear Father, I thank you for uh, Jesus once again, that you sent him to be the final payment, the final atonement, the final sacrifice, so that we would never have to sacrifice again. It would be finished in him. And as we take this bread, we remember that it represents his body. That his body, before it was even placed on the cross, was whipped and beaten beyond recognition. It's hard to picture, but we know it's important because it's a punishment that he took even though he was perfect. He took it for us. And so as we take this bread, we remember the body of Jesus. We remember the cross. In Jesus' name. Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, Father, we move to the cup, which represents the blood that flowed from Jesus' head, his hands, his feet, his side, probably so many wounds all over his body. It's gruesome, Father, to think about, to picture in our mind's eye. And yet, without the shedding of blood, there cannot be atonement. That for so many years, the, your people sacrificed animals over and over again, but it was never enough to cover their sin. And so you sent your son, fully God, fully man, to be that perfect atonement. And so as we drink this juice, this wine, we remember that it represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Verse 27. And he, Jesus, took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, before we go, don't leave yet. I want to talk to you about next week. Next week, we have a brand new family-friendly, that's right, kids will be invited to hang out with the adults, that it's going to be a teaching series for the family, the young, the old. No matter what age you are, you're going to learn something. And we'd prefer that you'd be in-house, if possible. The emergency orders are off here in the Yukon. But if you're still not comfortable, we will have digital options available. But we encourage you to come on back at 9.30 or 11 uh, a.m. Obviously, this is if you're in Whitehorse. If not, do online. And uh, we're going to be studying the prophet, the minor prophet Haggai. When's the last time you read Haggai, right? It's only two chapters long. We're going to take three weeks to do it. It's going to be awesome. Now, I could go into describing everything, but instead, what I want you to do right now is call the kids into the room, pause the video, call the kids in the room, because instead of describing it, I want to show you and them. Check this out. Once upon a time, there was a man named Solomon who built a mighty temple. But before long, the people of Judah turned away from God and began to worship foreign gods and idols. One day, God allowed the Babylonians to attack Judah and destroy the whole city, including God's temple. The people of Judah remained in captivity until one day, God raised up the prophet Haggai to inspire the people to get back to work, saying, the time is now. <laughs> 